Warning, this podcast contains descriptions of murder, torture and abuse. As a result, it may not be suitable for everybody. Toronto, Canada. One of the largest cities in Canada and just a short drive from Niagara Falls. It boasts the world famous CN Tower and is home to the Hockey Hall of Fame. Listen to the hometown murder cases of Paul Bernardo, a serial rapist and killer, Peter Woodcock, a child rapist and diagnosed psychopath, and Alison Parra, a missing 11 year old whose body was found in woods just two days later. First hometown murder case is Paul Bernardo. He was also known as Paul Jason Teal. He was a convicted serial killer and rapist. He was first known for initially committing a series of rape in Scarborough, Ontario, a suburb of Toronto, between 1987 and 1990. He subsequently committed three murders with his then wife Carla Homoka among other victims were her young sister, Tammy Homaker. After his capture and conviction, Bernardo was sentenced to life imprisonment and was later declared a dangerous offender and unlikely to be released. His father, Kenneth, fondled a girl and was charged with child molestation in 1975 and also sexually abused his daughter. His mother, depressed about her family's abuse, withdrew from family life and lived in a basement of their home in Scarborough in eastern metropolitan Toronto. Bernardo committed multiple sexual assaults, escalating in viciousness in around Scarborough. He attacked most of his victims after stalking them as they got off buses late in the evening. From May to September 1990, police submitted more than 130 suspect samples for DNA testing when they received two reports that the person they were seeking was Bernardo. The first in June had been fired by a bank employee. The second was from Tina Smyrnis, wife of one of the three Smyrnis brothers who were among Bernardo's closest friends. She told detectives that Bernardo had been called in on previous rape investigations, once in December 1987, but had never been interviewed. He frequently talked about his sex life he admitted that he liked rough sex, anal sex and anal lingers. Smyrna's phrasing, awkward and stilted, left detectives uncertain whether to take her seriously. However, after cross-checking several files, they decided to interview Bernardo. November 20th, 1990 interview lasted 35 minutes and Bernardo voluntarily provided samples for forensic testing. When detectives asked Bernardo why he thought he'd been interviewed for the rapes, he admitted that he resembled the composite. According to detectives, he was, quote, was far more credible than Sinernis, who, with an awkward, strange way of speaking, might just be trying to collect the wall a reward, end quote. Bernardo was released the next day. When she worked at a pet shop two years earlier, Homaka befriended a 15-year-old girl. On June 7, 1991, Homacourt invited the girl known as Jane Doe in for trials for a girls' night out. After an evening of shopping and dining, Homacourt piled Jane Doe with alcohol laced with halcyon. When the girl lost consciousness, Homacourt called Bernardo to tell him that his surprise wedding gift was ready. They undressed Jane Doe and Bernardo videotaped Homaka raping the girl before he penetrated her virginally and anally. 
The next morning, Jane Doe was nauseated. She thought that her vomiting was from the drinking alcohol from the night before and did not realise that she'd been sexually assaulted. Jane Doe was invited back to Port Dalhousie in August to spend the night. In a replay of what happened to Carla's sister, Tammy Homaker, Jane Doe, whose identity is now protected by law, stopped breathing as she was drugged and Bernardo began to rape her. Homaker called 911 for help but called back a few minutes later to say that everything is alright. The ambulance was recorded without follow-up. Jane Doe survived. By 1990, Bernardo was spending long periods of time with Homaker's family who liked him. Although he was engaged to Carla, he flirted with his younger sister, Tammy. Bernardo had not told them that he lost his job as an accountant and was smuggling cigarettes across the border from Canada to the United States. He had become obsessed with Tammy, peering into her window and entering her room to masturbate while she slept. Homaker helped Bernardo by breaking the windows in her sister's room, allowing him access. In July, he took Tammy across the border to get beer for a party. Bernardo later told his fiancée that they got drunk and began making out. According to Bernardo's testimony at the trial, Homaker laced spaghetti sauce with crushed Valium, which he stole from her employer at Martindale Animal Clinic. She served it to her sister, who lost consciousness. Bernardo then raped Tammy while Carla watched. Over the summer, he supplied Tammy, her friends, with gifts, food and soft drinks with a film and a few white flecks on the top. Six months before their 1991 wedding, Homaker stole the anaesthetic halothane from the clinic. On December 23rd, 1990, Homaker and Bernardo administered sleeping pills to the 15-year-old in a rum and eggnog cocktail. When Tammy lost consciousness, Homaka and Bernardo undressed her and Carla applied half of lane soaked cloth to her sister's nodes and mouth. Homaka wanted to give Tammy's virginity to Bernardo for Christmas. According to her, Bernardo was disappointed that he was not Carla's first sex partner. When Tammy's parents sleeping upstairs, they videotaped themselves raping her in the basement. Tammy began to vomit. They tried to revive her and called 991 after Hyde and Everson, dressing Tammy and moving her into the bedroom. A few hours later, Tammy was pronounced dead at St. Catherine's General Hospital without regaining consciousness. Despite their behaviour, vacuuming and washing laundry in the middle of the night, and despite a chemical burn on Tammy's face, the regional municipality of Niagara Coroner and Homaker's family accepted Bernardo's and Homaker's version of events. The official cause of death was accidental choking on vomit after consumption of alcohol. Bernardo and Homaker subsequently videotaped themselves with Carla wearing Tammy's clothing and pretending to be her. They moved out the house to rent a Port Dalhousie bungalow to allow Homaker's parents to grieve. Early in the morning of June 15, 1991, Bernardo detoured through Burlington, halfway between Toronto and St. Catharines, to steal license plates and found Leslie Mahaffey. The 14-year-old had missed her curfew after attending a friend's wake and was locked out of her house. Bernardo left his car and approached Mahaffey, saying that he wanted to break into a neighbour's house. Unfazed, she asked him for if she had any cigarettes. When Bernardo led her to his car, he blindfolded her, forced her into the car and drove her to Port Dalhousie and informed Homaker that they had a new victim. Bernardo and Homaker videotaped themselves torturing and sexually abusing Mahaffey while they listened to Bob Marley and David Bowie. At one point, Bernardo said, quote, You're doing a good job, Leslie, a damn good job, adding, The next two hours are going to determine what I do to you. Right now you're scoring perfect. End quote. On another segment of the tape played at Bernardo's trial, the assault escalated. Mahaffey cried out in pain and begged Bernardo to stop. In the crown description of the scene, he was sodomising her while her hands were bound with twine. Mahaffey later told Bernardo that her blindfold seemed to be slipping, which signalled the possibility that she could be identified by her attackers if she lived. The following day, Bernardo claimed Homaker fed her a lethal dose of halcyon, 
Homika claimed that Bernardo strangled her. They put Malhafi's body in the basement and the day after which Homika's family had dinner at the house. After Homika and their remaining daughter Lori left, Bernardo and Homika decided the best way to dispose of the evidence would be to dismember Mahaffey and encase each of her parts in remains in cement. Bernardo brought a dozen bags of cement at a hardware store the following day. He kept the receipts which were damaging at the trial. Bernardo used his grandfather's circular saw to dismember the body. Bernardo and Holker made a number of trips to the dump cement blocks in Lake Gibson, 18 kilometres south of Port Dalhousie. At least one of the blocks weighed over 200 pounds and was beyond their ability to sink. It lay near the shore where it was found by Michael Dosette and his son Michael Jr. They were on a fishing expedition on June 29, 1991. Mahothi's orthodontic appliance was instrumental in identifying her. During the after school hours of April 16, 1992, Bernardo and Homaker drove through St. Catharines to look for another potential victim. Students had gone home, but the streets were generally empty. They passed Holy Cross Secondary School, a Saint a Catholic high school in the city north end, and they spotted 15-year-old Kirsten French. They pulled into a parking lot of a nearby Grace Lutheran Church, and Hopkirk got out the car, map in hand, pretending to need assistance. When French looked at the map, Bernardo attacked her from behind, brandishing a knife and forcing her into the front seat of their car. Homacle controlled the girl by pulling her hair. French took the same route home every day, taking only 15 minutes to get home and care for her dog. Soon after she had been uh, had arrived, her parents became convinced she met foul play and notified the police. Within 24 hours, the Niagara Regional Police Service assembled a team, searched French's route and found several witnesses who had seen the abduction from different locations, giving police a clear picture. French's shoe recovered from the parking lot and discovered the seriousness of the abduction. Over the Easter weekend, Bernardo and Homaka videotaped themselves torturing, raping and sodomizing French, forcing her to drink large amounts of alcohol and submit to Bernardo. At his trial, Crown Prosecutor Ray Hallelan said that Bernardo always intended to kill her because he never blindfolded and could identify her captors. The following day, Bernardo and Homaka murdered French before going to Homaka's for Easter dinner. Homaka testified at her trial that Bernardo strangled French for seven minutes while she watched. Bernardo said Homaka beat French with a rubber mallet because she tried to escape and French was strangled with a noose around her neck with which to be secured to a hope chest. Homaka then went to fix her hair. French's nude body was found on April 30th, 1992 in a ditch in Burlington, about 45 minutes from St. Catharines and a short drive from the cemetery while Mahaffey is buried. She had been washed and her hair was cut off. Although it's thought that French hair was removed as a trophy, Homaka testified that it was cut to impede identification. Bernardo was tried for the murders of French and Mahaffey in 1995 and his trial included detailed testimony from Homaka and videotapes of the rapes. Bernardo testified that the deaths were accidental, later claimed that his wife was the actual killer. On September 1st, 1995, Bernardo was convicted of a number of offences, including the two first-degree murders and two aggravated sexual assaults, and sentenced to life in prison without parole for at least 25 years. He was designated a dangerous offender, making him unlikely to ever be released. In a plea bargain, a 12-year sentence for manslaughter, Homaka testified against Bernardo in his trial. The plea bargain was criticised by many Canadians since Bernardo's first defence lawyer, Ken Murray, withheld videotapes for 17 months. They are considered crucial vigilance evidence and prosecutors said they would never have been agreed to the plea if they'd seen the tapes. Murray was later acquitted of obstruction of justice and faced a disciplinary hearing by the Law Society of Upper Canada. 
The second hometown murder case is David Michael Kruger, best known by his birth name of Peter Woodcock, who was a Canadian serial killer and child rapist. He was diagnosed as a psychopath. He gained notoriety for the murders of three young children in Toronto in the late 1950s, as well as a murder in 1991 on his first day of unsupervised release from a psychiatric institution which had been incarcerated for his earlier crimes. As an adopted child, Kruger lived in numerous foster homes and showed signs of severe me mental and emotional trauma when he found a permanent foster home at the age of three. Unable to adjust to social situations, he was bullied by his peers. He would often wander from his home by foot, bicycle or train to parts of Toronto where he would molest dozens of children and ultimately murder three. Found not guilty by reason of his insanity for his crimes, he was sent to a psychiatric facility. Psychiatrics placed him in an experimental treatment programme for psychopaths. By those treatments proved ineffective when he murdered a fellow psychiatric patient in 1991. After his death in 2010, he was described in the Toronto Star as the serial killer they couldn't cure. Peter Woodcock's prized possession was a red and white Sherwin bicycle in which he satisfied his continual compulsion to wander. He rode the bike to the far reaches of the city, even during the deep, cold torrental winters, and involved a fantasy in which he led a gang of 500 invisible boys on bikes called the Winchester Heights Gang. His foster parents were aware of his fantasy and his compulsion to wander, but they were unaware that he began travelling around Toronto on his bike and sexually assaulting children. On September 15, 1956, Woodcock was riding his bike around the grounds of Exhibition Place, where he met a seven-year-old Wayne Mallet. He lured the boy out of sight and then proceeded to strangle him to death. Mallet's body was found in the early hours of September 16th, he was dressed in a British schoolboy blazer, shirt and plaid trousers. It appeared that his clothing had been removed and he'd been redressed. His face was pushed into the dirt and his two bite marks were found on his body, one on the boy's calf and the other on his buttock. There was no evidence of rape. Pennies were found ritualistically scattered around the body. Woodcock had defecated next to the victim as well. Toronto police initially arrested and interrogated another boy, Ron Moffat, Though relentlessly questioning him, they extracted a confession from the 14-year-old Moffat. Despite witnesses who clearly placed him in a movie theatre before and after the murder, he was found guilty and sentenced to youth for detention. Eventually, police acknowledged there was a serial predator in Toronto, but Moffat was not released. However, when notes were shared between forces, Woodcock was arrested. After his conviction, Woodcock was called as a defence witness for Moffat. The wrongfully murder charge was stayed in 1957 and Moffat was released from custody. On October 6, 1956, Woodcock was riding his bike around Cabbage Town when he picked up a nine-year-old Gary Morris. He then drove the boy to Cherry Beach where he strangled and beat him to death with a coroner later determined that boss Morris had died from a ruptured liver. Morris's body was found with a bite mark on his throat and this time paper clips seemed to have been ritualistically sprinkled near the corpse. Again the clothing had been removed from the victim and then he'd been redressed. On January 19, 1957, Woodcock was again riding his bike when he approached a four-year-old Carol Voice and offered her a ride. He then drove her under the Bloor viaduct and murdered her. When she was found, her clothes had been pulled off. It appeared she'd been choked into unconsciousness and sexually molested. Her death was caused by a tree branch being forcibly inserted into her vagina. Witnesses saw a teenager cycling away from Carol Voice's crime scene. An accurate composite sketch was created based on those witness descriptions. This sketch ran on the front page of the Toronto Star and would lead to Woodcock's arrest on January 21st, 1957 and his subsequent confession to all three murders. He recalled upon his arrest, quote, My fear was that Mother would find out. Mother was my biggest fear. I didn't know if the police would let her at me, end quote. Woodcock was tried only for the murder of Carol Voice. 
on April 11, 1957, and after a four-day trial, he was found not guilty by reason of insanity and was sent to Oak Ridge Division of the Maximum Security Health Mental Centre in Ontario. While imprisoned, Woodcock was diagnosed as a psychopath. He underwent various forms of psychiatric therapy, including LSD treatments when they were popular in the 1960s. He was also given other personality breaking drugs. He was subject to a personality breaking therapy in which inmates challenged him and others to their belief systems, which inmates referred to as the 100 day hating. This was developed in the late 50s to the early 60s by a Harvard psychologist and former CIA interrogation and psychological warfare expert, Harry A. Murray. In the 60s, one of Murray's volunteer personality destruction subjects had been a young Harvard student, Ted Kaczynski, the future Unabomber. He convinced inmates that he had contact with a mythical group on the outside and in order to be initiated, inmates had to perform oral sex on him and bring him gifts and cigarettes. Woodcock was eventually transferred to a less restricted institution and ultimately arrived at the Brookville Psychiatric Hospital. Here staff indulged his passion for trains by taking him to the Smith Falls Railway Museum and even took him to see the Silence of the Lamb film. During this time, he legally changed his name to David Michael Kruger and rekindled a relationship with Ruth Bruce Hamill, an Ottawa killer who'd been released from Oak Ridge and was working as a security guard at Ottawa Courthouse. Kruger convinced Hamill an alien brotherhood would solve his problems if he could help kill another Brookville inmate, Dennis Kerr. On July 13th, 1991, Bruce Hamill went to a hardware store bought a plumber's wrench, hatchet, knives and a sleeping bag, then went to Brookville Hospital and signed out Kruger on his first publicly extorted day out. During the first hour of his first weekend pass, in 34 years, Kruger arranged to meet Dennis Kerr in the woods near Brookville, where Kruger would loan Kerr $500. When Dennis Kerr arrived as instructed, Kruger struck him on the head with a pipe wrench and continued to beat him into unconsciousness. Kruger and Hamill then seized the hatchet and knife they had hidden in the bushes while waiting for Kerr's arrival and hacked and stabbed Kerr, mutilating his body, cutting it open and nearly severing his head. Drenched in Kerr's blood, they then stripped themselves naked and sodomised the corpse. Kruger then left the scene, walked to a police station about two miles away and turned himself in. For the murder of Dennis Kerr, Kruger was transferred back to Oak Ridge Division of the Pentagorshan Mental Health Centre, where he spent the majority of his 34 preceding years in custody. In the years after Kerr's murder, he was the focus of a biography and several documentary films and sometimes tried to explain why he killed, but he never came up with rational reasons. He said in a 1993 interview, I'm accused of having no morality, which is a fair assessment because my morality is whatever the system allows. On March 5th, 2010, his 71st birthday, Kruger died of natural causes. And the last hometown murders case we're looking at today is the murder of Alison Parrott. She was born September 28th, 1974 and was an 11-year-old girl who went missing from her home in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Her remains were found two evenings later in a densely wooded area of the King's Mill Park. At about 11 o'clock on the morning of July 25th, 1986, Alison received a phone call at her Summerhill Avenue home in Midtown, Toronto. A male caller claimed to be a photographer asked to meet her at the University of Toronto's Varsity Stadium, where he said he would be taking publicity photos of her and her teammates. Alison, a member of the Tom Longboat Club, was a participant in an international track and field meet in Plainfield, New Jersey on 1st of August, exactly a week later. She phoned her mother, Leslie, at work and got permission to attend the session. The same man had called 11 days earlier while Alison had been at summer camp asking for her. She then left to keep the appointment, leaving word with the family housekeeper. When she failed to return home at 6pm, Peter and Leslie Parrott inquired among their neighbours, none of whom had seen her, 
when they called the police. Alison was found dead two evenings later in a densely wooded area of Kingsmill Park on the Humber River just below the Old Mill subway station. She had been raped and strangled. In May 1987, Leslie Parrott, aided by colleagues at the advertising agency where she worked, launched the Canada-wide Stay Alert, Stay Safe programme. Aimed at children aged 7 to 10, the programme's main objective was to attune children's instincts to dangerous situations, whether at home or elsewhere. Almost exactly a decade after Parrott's murder, Francis Carl Roy was arrested for the crime on July 31st, 1996. Roy, a First Nations man from Malatunlin Island, was an avid runner with a keen interest in photography. He also had a long criminal record which included such offences as burglary, petty theft, fraud, assault and rape. At the time of Alison's death, Roy had been on parole after serving only two and a half years of an 11 year sentence for the rapes of two teenage girls, 19 and 14 year old respectively. DNA evidence found in Alison's body linked him conclusively to the Alison murder. Roy's only explanation for the DNA defence was that he had discovered Alison's naked body while looking for a place to urinate while on a run in the park. Once discovering the deceased body of Alison Parrott in the brush, he had a sudden urge to stick his fingers inside her. Since he was uncircumcised, Roy had to push back the skin of his penis. Having masturbated earlier that day, he still had semen on his hands. The jury deliberated for six days. On April 13, 1999, he was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life imprisonment with possibility of parole for 25 years. He will be eligible for parole in 2021. Alison's remains were cremated. She is buried in Mount Pleasant Cemetery, Toronto. There is a little park dedicated to Alison and the children of Somerville in the neighbourhood where she lived. Thank you for everybody who's listened to this episode. This episode has been researched, written and hosted by me, Andrew Knight. Sound, music and editing has been provided by Harry Edmonds. Make sure you subscribe to the show anywhere where you listen to your podcast. This allows the episode to be downloaded automatically as soon as it's released. Please reach out to us on the social media. We're at Hometown Murders on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. We'd love to hear from you. Please support the show by leaving a five-star rating or a review. It really does help. 